Varma. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Hello. <laughs> My name is Madeline De Delpha, and I am Assistant Director of Programs and Community Engagement here at the Rose. And on behalf of our entire team, I want to welcome you to the Rose Art Museum. I'm so pleased that you have joined us at the Rose for tonight's program, Iran's Women, Life, Freedom Movement, one year later, presented by the Crown Center for Middle East Studies. This program is being held here at the Rose in conjunction with our current exhibition, Argavan Kosravi Black Rain, curated by our director, Dr. Ganit Ankori. I hope you've had a chance to visit this incredible show in the Lois Foster wing right outside. Born in Iran in 1984, Argavan Kosravi creates luminous and powerful work that is directly informed by her experiences as a young woman in Iran, as an Iranian immigrant in the United States, and as a, an Iranian exile inspired by the Women Life Freedom Movement. The artist herself explained, and I quote, I'm not interested in perpetuating notions of cultural exoticism and portrayals of Iranian women as victims. My work is a vehicle for shifting power, validating personal storytelling, and connecting to universal messages about human rights, end quote. I can't think of a more brilliant setting for this evening's conversation. So please join me in welcoming Gary Seymour, Crown Family Director of the Crown Center for Middle East Studies. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm Gary Seymour, Director of the Crown Center for Middle East Studies. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Anit and Maddie and the Rose Art Museum for hosting this event. As Maddie explained, we could not have a more appropriate a better setting for this discussion on the women, life, and freedom movement in Iran. Uh, it's a spectacular exhibit, and I encourage all of you to visit the Rose Art Museum in order to see it. I want to say just a few things about the Crown Center before we uh, go ahead with our program. Uh, this is our kickoff event. Every September, we have a special event. Uh, to welcome uh, students, faculty, and staff uh, back to campus. The Crown Center is committed to conducting a balanced and dispassionate research on the modern Middle East. Our approach is multidisciplinary, so we cover the social sciences, politics, economics, history, sociology, anthropology, and we cover all the countries in the Middle East, the Arab countries, Israel, uh, Turkey and Iran. Uh, in addition to the courses that the Crown Center faculty teach, we offer a full program of speaker events, our new podcast, Counter Argument, and publications like the Crown Center Middle East Brief and Crown Conversations. So I encourage all of you to please check out our website uh, so you can uh, join our meetings, listen to the podcast, uh, read our publications, uh, and follow us on our various social media channels. So now I'm going to turn things over to our distinguished director of uh, research, Nagme Sorabi, who's going to moderate a panel discussion on the status and the impact of the women life freedom movement in Iran as we near the one year anniversary of the tragic uh, death of uh, Masha Amini. Uh, 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 I'm sorry, Masha Amimi. Thank you. Well, thank you, Gary. Thank you, Ganit. Um, I'm Nagme Sohrabi. As uh, Gary mentioned, I'm the director for research at the Crown Center. And before we start, I want to add my thanks again to Ganit and her team, to Maddie and to Chad, and also thank our team at the Crown Center, which is the lovely women in the back. Um, Karen, Christina, and Danielle, and Rami, our assistant director for research, without whom none of this would have happened. Um, I just want to first put out a note for our audience who are online and who have joined us via a live webinar that we had every intention of being able to get your questions and add them to the questions of the audience here also. But technology always fails. It's not even sometimes. It will fail when you need it. Um, but we just want to assure you that if you have questions, please do add them to the Q&A. It's being monitored, and we will give a transcript of it to our wonderful panel 
um, at the end of the e event. Um, I'm going to start by setting out, um, setting sort of the table, and then we're going to move towards two questions from our panel, I'm, and I'm also going to introduce them. Um, so it's been, it's hard to believe that it's been almost a year to the day, actually, when the death of a young Kurdish Iranian woman, Mahsa Jina Amini, upended the political and social landscape in Iran, and also upended our understanding of the Islamic Republic. As is now well known, Mahsa Amini um, died in police custody in Tehran from injuries that she sustained when she was arrested for improper veiling, i.e., um, she was showing some hair from her scarf. Her death sparked demonstrations across the country, the intensity and geography of which um, one of our panelists, Ali Kadivar, has worked on extensively and will be discussing today. These protests, which quickly came under the slogan of Women, Life, Freedom, um, which is borrowed from the Kurdish women's movement, took everyone by surprise, including the four of us up here, and I'm sure many of you in the audience. Um, these, from people here, but also people who were living in Iran, um, everyone was surprised by what was happening. It's not that Iran had not seen mass protests before. As Oran Keshavarzian has written about, um, 2017 and 2019 had already seen bloody protests spread throughout the country involving hundreds of people and um, ending with scores of dead and wounded. And as Nazarene Shahrukhni, the only woman on the panel, <laughs> Um, I've been teasing her about this, ha has shown in her own work, women and the Islamic Republic of Iran have engaged in a battle over a whole range of issues for decades. But something was different in what happened last year. First, they were the longest set of protests since the 2009 Green Movement. Second, the protesters were predominantly younger. People called them Gen Z generation for the most part. Third, the demands, while undoubtedly expansive, were articulated around the right of women to be allowed something as essential as the right to not end up in a body bag or in prison for showing some hair. Um, fourth, they forced into the public consciousness, both inside and outside of Iran, conversations about Iran's ethnic minorities. Fifth, they revealed the limits and the limitations of Iran's diasporic politics, particularly if and what opposition means outside of Iran. And lastly, they fundamentally changed both the polity and the state. Even if the political system remains in place today, the sight of women walking in the streets without a headscarf, along with the sense of both individual and collective empowerment that these protests engendered in, in every sense of the word, would have been really unimaginable two years ago. So it's important to say that over the course of the protests, Close to 20,000 people were arrested, hundreds of people were killed, including children, and several young men executed. University students who were at the heart of these protests have been systematically banned from continue finishing their degrees. Journalists, activists, and artists have been detained, imprisoned, released, and sometimes detained again. Some, such as the journalist Nilufar Hamedi and Elohim Muhammadi, who were crucial in getting the story out, are still in prison. And in the lead up to this one year anniversary in, uh, of the protests, there have been purges of university professors and even more students. So this future is seemingly bleak. And I'll tell you, I have no idea if they're going to argue otherwise. Maybe they will. So last October, the Crown Center invited our wonderful three panelists to share their thoughts as the events were unfolding. And I highly recommend um, you watch, it's on our, in the Crown Center's YouTube channel, and you watch that um, conversation. Um, but we invited them on campus a year later to do something that we rarely do in, in political analysis, is to ask the people who assess the situation to reassess the situation with new data points and new information. And I'm very, very honored and excited that they accepted our invitation. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of you already know our distinguished panelists, and their bios are available online. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to quickly say that to my left is Muhammad Ali Kadivar, who's an assistant professor of sociology and international studies at some other university in Boston, Boston <laughs> College. <laughs> And he's the author of the wonderful book, Popular Politics and the Path to Durable Democracy, which came out in November of 2022. 
After that is Nazanin Shahrutni. She's the Associate Professor of International Studies um, at Simon Fraser University, which we're very excited. She was in Europe before that, and now she is um, on our shores. And she's the author of the fantastic book, Women in Place, The Politics of Gender Segregation in Iran. And Oran Keshavarzian is Associate Professor and Chair of Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies at NYU. Um, he has several books, but he has a book coming out in spring of 2024 called Making Space for the Gulf, Histories of Regionalism in the Middle East. I've heard it's good, but I haven't read it yet. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, let's just um, jump into it. I'm gonna start with Ali. So um, at the time that the protests were happening, so a year ago basically, there was a lot of talk about the size and the geography of these protests. And often that conversation that was happening as the protests were going on, it was in this context of, oh, here's how it's a revolution, or here's how it's not a revolution. Now I know you've been working on actually finding data for the size and the geography. So can you talk a little bit about what you found in this past year about that, and if possible, put it in some kind of comparison with the previous protests? Yeah, thank you for the great question. Uh, so since 2017, uh, December of 2017, this type of anti-regime protests have started in Iran. Anti-regime protests, I mean when people come out and they clearly chant slogans about end of the regime against the clergy. They call for the death of the Iran's leader, Ali Khamenei. And um, they, they, they're asking for regime change, basically. So there was one episode in uh, December of 2017, January of 2018. It lasted for 10 days. The regime suppressed that. About 20, more than 20 people were killed. Then in November of 2019, there was one week of protest uh, people protested after there was a sudden hike in the fuel prices. And then we have uh, this um, protest that started after the killing of Mahsa Amini. These are the three major episodes of, I would say, anti-regime protests. There have been other type of protests that have been uh, happening in Iran. So for each of these uh, episodes, uh, I've been putting together with the help of my PhD students at Boston College what we call uh, protest event catalog data, which means we just we, we use videos that protesters take, as well as the news reports from inside Iran, like Irna, Iran's national uh, news agency, and several diaspora websites and news agency outside the country. We use these sources to find out which city had protests in what day, what type of uh, protest it was, whether it was a demonstration, a strike, a sit-in, what kind of slogans were chanted. Um, so this can give us the map of the protest, how, how they lasted, and then when we put this along other socioeconomic and political data, we can find some patterns. So this was ob obviously massive because the peak of protest, I would say, uh, lasted for 14 weeks. The other one, as I said, seven days and 10 days, so you already see the, the difference. We, or, we also know that the geographic spread was much wider. The first wave, the first episode, it was about 85, 86 districts out of 429 uh, districts, according to the last census that had protest. In 2019, this expanded to about 95, 96. And in this last uh, long episode after the women life freedom, it's more than 115. Uh, and when, uh, so, and there are, in the first two ones, there are about 200 protest events that have happened in multiple cities over one, uh, 10 days and seven weeks. Here we have about 3,000 uh, unique protest events that have happened over these 14 weeks. So the scale is much larger. And I just go to the patterns, what patterns we Can have. Can I ask yes. you before you go, what's the cutoff point for the 14 weeks? What's the event? Yeah, so the cutoff points is the student day. The protests continued after that, but we didn't have a search after the student day. So we, we, we could have gone further, but we put the cutoff point there, yes. So if you go until the last protest day, it's even more than 14 weeks, but I think most of the protests happened within 14 weeks. So the major patterns that uh, I found after we put together data, it took a lot, long time. 
And at some point when the protests were not happening, it gave us just more time to catch up because we were long behind. So the first, I looked at the correlations. First thing was districts that uh, lower electoral turnout in the most recent elect, uh, presidential election of uh, 2021 had higher protest rates. This is consistent with what I found in the 2019 protest. So you see this reverse relationship. The more the regime has been able to bring people or people have gone to the electoral arena, the less they have gone to the protest arena. And this has been happening. The electoral process has been narrowed down in Iran in terms of competition, which has been translated into participation. Electoral participation has considerably declined over the last uh, few years in Iran. So this was the first, uh, first pattern, which was consistent with 2019. The second pattern that I found was, this time uh, I put it along the, some data set that uh, we have on languages that are spoken in Iran, and we can use the languages as a proxy for ethnicities in Iran. So this is probably not a surprise to you, but districts with higher proportion of Kurdish population had higher rates of protest throughout. Second thing that was consistent throughout was Kurdish, uh, sorry, Sunni districts no. had higher rates of protest. So these two things already speak to the identity of Mahsa Amini. She was a Sunni Kurdish woman. And when I compare this with 2019, I found something interesting. I, I see that the trigger shapes the geography of uh, both of these two episodes. The trigger in 2019 was a sudden hike in the fuel prices, in, in gasoline, in oil. And so I have a paper about this. But the, the districts that had oil facilities had higher rates of protest in 2019. And most of the oil facilities are in regions that are predominantly uh, inhabited by the Arab population. So districts with higher proportion of Arab population had more protests in 2019. But they didn't protest this time. Mm -hmm. Another ethnic group um, uh, joins this protest. So when, if I look at the whole period, it's only the Kurdish variable that is significant. But if I look like three or four weeks in, the districts with higher proportion of Baluch population also had higher rates of protest. So this shows this, there was some scale shift that happened. It started with Kurdish regions, it of course spread to other parts of the country. It was not only the Kurdish population. But from the beginning towards the end, the Kurdish areas stayed the hotbed of protest. And the Sunni areas, so again, uh, there are two major Kurdish provinces, with Kurds being also in other provinces in Iran. Kerman Shah, those are Shia Kurds. Kurdistan, these are Sunni Kurds. Uh, Kurdistan had more uh, protests. And then in uh, West Azerbaijan, province of Iran, also there were protests. In East Azerbaijan, there was not much protest. Because East Azerbaijan is mostly Turkish. West Azerbaijan, a province of Iran, is a mix of Kurdish and uh, Turkish population. So these were the very interesting Patterns that I find, I don't know how many more minutes do I have. You're done with okay. your minutes. <laughs> but that was excellently done. Just so you guys know, I scared them. I was like, if you don't stop in five minutes, I'm going to stop you. That was beautifully done. Um, so thank you so much. I want to come back to some of the issues that you talked about. But if we're thinking about, you said Mass Amini's identity, yeah. Kurdish, Sunni, and of course the issue of her being a woman, um, and particularly the veil. And Nazanin, mean, this question's for you. I mean, I think I would say one of the biggest things that has surprised me in this past year is all this discussion in Iran around what's now known as the hijab bill, right? Layahe hijab. Um, and the reason it surprised me is that for all these years, so 40 something years, the Islamic Republic has had mandatory veiling, but no one's been talking about it. So you didn't have to talk about it in order to enforce it. And so the fact that now the parliament and there's all this discussion around this hijab veil to me is also a turning point tells us that there's been some kind of rupture. So can you talk to us about what is this hijab bill? What does it mean? What are the discussions around it? I came prepared, wrote my notes so that I, go, I won't get cut off at uh, five minutes. But um, um, thank you for the question. The hijab bill is actually a detailed, um, meticulously drafted bill that, has, um, that is composed of five parts, 70 articles, and hundreds of clauses that aim to enforce stricter rules and punishments uh, for non-compliance with mandatory hijab and gender segregation. Um, 
which are the highly symbolic pillars of the Islamic Republic. Uh, the protests of the past year, as Naqme um, mentioned, and also um, Ali also highlighted the patterns, posed a direct challenge to, the, uh, to state authority not only as they demanded the de-estatification of society and particularly of women's bodies, but also as they exposed the fragmented, uh, almost cacophonic um, character of the state, the multiplicity of different, even conflicting official interpretations of and relations to the veil and veiled bodies uh, of women were stark reminders of the failure of the state's approach to mandatory veiling. For instance, the lack of consensus among the judiciary, members of the parliament, officials from different ministries, governors, uh, and the police um, on whether and in what ways unveiling was to be penalized revealed a fractured state. So there is a perf performative element to the bill. That's what I'm uh, trying to get at. It is central to the staging of the state as the state, as a unified entity. The bill, in my, my opinion, is also an attempt on the part of the state to disrupt the ongoing performance of, um, of resistance by women, um, which is happening on a daily basis on the streets of um, uh, various cities in Iran. So what does the bill do? I think first and foremost, the bill seeks to co-opt groups of citizens by implicating them in surveillance and uh, enforcement. Apart from penalties for um, the women who might refuse to cover, um, it details financial and administrative um, uh, penalties for service providers and business owners that allow uncovered women to frequent their businesses, such as cafes, restaurants, shops, or even um, their taxis. For example, according to Articles 41 and 42, if a business wants to remain open, they need to step in as the arm of the state and force women to comply or expel them. In this sense, the bill aligns the economic interests of business owners and service providers with the political interests of the state. The intention is clear, disrupting the flow of uh, the everyday um, and turning everyday spaces into locations of surveillance, um, um, uh, dividing citizens through pitting them against each other by actually um, making them police each other. The second one is the political economy of the bill. The state monetizes and benefits from the breach of the hijab bill. Mm -hmm. Repeat offenders face, uh, face increased fines, something that um, critiques of the class bias of the, uh, of the bill have already highlighted. It also replaces the informal economy of the bribe payments um, to the security police, which had become common practice in certain restaurants and cafes that were known to, be, to have a relaxed environment and that were already kind of catering to um, unveiled women or bad hijab uh, women before. So the state has replaced the, uh, the bill um, in, its, in the place of this informal system. The bill uh, establishes a system of legalized bribery, or that's at least what I, how I see it, with the state as beneficiary. As when the fines are paid by business owners, they can reopen their shops or their businesses. So the state basically formalizes something that was already happening as an informal arrangement. And my final point, <laughs> while, while most analysts and commentators have focused on the repressive aspect of the bill, I want to highlight here that the bill benefits the state's clientele and give a wink, gives a wink to certain loyal constituencies, promising loans, tax credits, and other non-monetary support to those propagating the hijab and the hijab culture. I had pointed out in my book, Women in Place, that in addition to exploring the ways the state disables uh, undesired effects through prohibition and repression, it is important to look at the um, uh, productive interventions of the state, the ways in which the state enables desired effects. So the bill, uh, in, the, in the hijab bill, um, uh, there are clauses where it requires the Ministry of Economic Affairs and um, Finance to provide tax credits and bank loans to support organizations and companies that supply cultural and artistic products and services that are focused on hijab or companies that are involved in the production of black chador fabric, thus uh, boosting civil society and manufacturing activities supporting the bill's objectives. So let me conclude by saying, if and when the bill is fully approved, because it, is, uh, it was approved in, the, in a particular commission, but it's coming back to the parliament, it is likely to have a limited shelf life. Um, 
just like the satellite bill before it, which prohibited the installation and usage of satellite dishes and uh, eventually became defunct. Yeah, yeah. Wow. We're going to come back to that also. Thank you. Um, so, Anang, you're coming last because in some way the question I want to ask of you is, is and if, 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 like if I wanted to think about what Ali said, and I think he kind of emphasized in some ways a continuity, right? The trigger leads to the geography no matter which process, process you're talking about. And in some ways Nazani has laid out, I would say continuities, but more of a rupture when it comes to what the hijab bill means. I want to remind you of something that you said last year. You're the only one I'm going to remind us of. Um, where you said that you, you were thinking ahead last year and saying that you think one of the things that is going to come out of these protests is that what we thought we knew about the Islamic Republic, we may, it may have so changed that the things that we thought we knew may not be true anymore. Um, one of the things that you have written about extensively is the ways in which um, these protests are built into the DNA of the system, what you call the cycles of protest and repression. So I was just wondering if you could speak a bit about whether you have had thoughts about, is this a rupture from that aspect of it, um, what has happened in the past year, but also regardless of whether it's a rupture or a continuity and whether these protests ha are seen to have failed or did not, what can they tell us about the moment in we're in now in terms of the Islamic Republic state? Right. Um, those are very good questions, very difficult questions. Um, you know, always the question of rupture is, is hard to assess in the moment with maybe something that people could look back on 10 years from now and some, or so. But um, building off on, uh, on, on the wonderful uh, comments and analysis presented by the, uh, my, my uh, panelists, I mean, Clearly, there's some, some unique aspects to this uh, round of, um, and I'll use uh, Ali's term, uh, anti-regime protests, right? The, the, the scope, the scale, the ge geographic scale, the, um, the, the, the ability for the protests to, to sustain their uh, anti-regime um, uh, activities was, was, was something that the Islamic Republic hasn't experienced in these 40-some uh, years. Um, however, you're right to paint me as someone who is for a number of years now argue that the Islamic Republic um, has always, um, in, a, in a sense, been unable to fully corral society. Um, it has built a very uh, engaged, dynamic, educated, aspiring, for lack of a better term, middle class sort of society. Due, due to its pretty extensive expanding in the, in the 1980s and 1990s in education, healthcare, infrastructure, and so forth. And because of that, um, uh, citizens have challenged authority. Now, sometimes the authority is at the level of the governor, the mayor, the, the, uh, the uh, employer, and so forth. So we have had lots of protests, labor protests, environmental protests, and so on and so forth not reaching the scale of, to, to, to describe them as anti-regime, the ones that we've seen in the last um, uh, four or five years, but previously, uh, over the last 20, 30 years, Iran has been a um, highly contentious society. Simultaneously, and I think Nazanin's comments just now also uh, echo this, the Iranian political elite has, has never been able to actually maintain a consensus. It continuously fragments and fractures um, we keep thinking, oh, well, they've unified the state, it's all under the in the hands of the conservatives, but then we realize, oh, there are deep divisions amongst the conservatives, whether it's ideological, generational, economic interests, and so on and so forth. So there's always fragments, and dissent uh, airs itself, right? And because of the, the basic institutions of, 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 of republicanism, um, now increasingly uh, limited, you know, I think uh, Ali's finding that in uh, regions where electoral participation is greater, protests are, are, um, are less, it may, that gives us a sense. There are other avenues to try to shape public policy, to challenge political rulers. The electoral ba ballot, obviously it's failing many, many Iranians in many parts of the country. That's why they took the risk and had the courage to take to the streets. It obviously doesn't work everywhere and for all Iranians. 
Having said that, if I can pivot a little bit, I mean, I don't like to use the word failure. I wouldn't describe what we see in Iran or what we saw in Egypt or Tunisia or, um, uh, or Occupy New York, frankly, as failure. But I do think we, should, we need to grapple with the, uh, with the, the issue that the, the Mahsa Amini protest movement was defeated, right? We may not like to say that, but it was defeated. It was, it was marshaled. The, its anti-regime call for radical transformation of the Islamic Republic, whether it's the removal of the Supreme Leader, it, it failed. We're nowhere, we're nowhere near that. First of all, let me just make, I don't want to, I'm not saying the Iranian society has not changed. I'm not saying relationships between husbands and wives, fathers and daughters, uh, neighbors, um, shopkeepers and customers have not been changed. I'm not saying that people's women have not been empowered, young people have not been empowered. Absolutely, Iranian society, Iranians have been transformed and transfixed by these events. Events that they, 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 they created, right? So that there absolutely has been uh, transformations. But we have to come to, the, to grips with that the, the Islamic Republic was able to manage and corral with enormous amount of coercion, absolutely. Uh, the number of deaths uh, are, are un unprecedented. We have at least 500 people lost their lives, um, and, and probably more in these last few um, uh, months. Thousands, uh, Nachman eloquently articulated the, the, the coercion of thousands of uh, arrests. Uh, people who've just lost their jobs. We, you know, uh, we, we sometimes forget these journalists, their whole careers have been sidelined, right? Um, you know, even if they're not in prison, they, they, they have to find other forms of work. Students, uh, educations, university professors, as we speak, are losing their jobs every hour, every day, right? So the, it uses, uses an enormous amount of coercion. But at the same time, it, it also was able to use um, other forms of, of, um, of both, um, in a sense, convincing its supporters that they are there to stay. And also, this category that Iranians like to call the gray, uh, uh, gray strata of society, the gray. The people that may not be supportive of the Islamic Republic, but at the same time uh, are not willing to go out into the streets, are not willing to remove their veil or, or what have you, these, take these sorts of steps. Well, this group may have been sympathetic in September, October, November, but I think what we saw subsequently was a, um, an unwillingness on their part to join the protest, uh, the protest movement. Unwi uh, and, and here we have to criticize the opposition, everyone, for not offering a viable alternative to the Islamic Republic. That's, for me, one of the lessons that we have, we have seen. If I can just end with one last point. The, the other part that for me is a black box is that we also have to recall that as in this past year, society has changed and has been, uh, has been affected by this, both uprising and the defeat of the uprising. But the other part that I think we have to think about is that the, the Islamic Republic is also being changed. Not only are they, as you both mentioned, are having to debate the hijab and how do we enforce it and why do we have it and do we use economic uh, tools and so forth, but um, you know, clear, from what I gather, clearly certain members of the elite are rising up the uh, ladder because they are members of the security apparatus, while maybe economic uh, members of the IRGC have lost sway. So this is something that for me, I don't have uh, full information or knowledge, but I, th this past year has been momentous, but also for the constellation that we, we ultimately describe the political elite in Iran. And that's something that we probably won't have a good grasp of uh, for a few years down the line of who is this elite. And, and this is important because we do know that there will be a transition away from Khamenei uh, in one form or another. So a, a lot of things have happened that I think um, will affect who replaces him in, in, in the coming years. Thank you. Before I push back on what you said, I would just wanted to see if you guys wanted to add to anything to either to what you each have said, or anything that Arang has said before, right? Push back on that. Yeah, point. please do. Um, I just wanted to add um, to what Arang um, and Ali eloquently kind of laid out that um, I think Iran's domestic politics cannot be understood decoupled from the web of international relations and transactions that the Islamic Republic is involved in. So if we look at the past several years, what we see is that 
actually already a year prior to the movement, um, Iran and China had signed a cooperation agreement which actually channeled 400 billion, um, China is supposed to channel 400 billion um, dollars over 25 years in exchange for a steady supply of oil uh, and other things. The same, and then China also brokered a deal between um, uh, rapprochement between uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia. And following that, China opened a branch, a Bank of China, in Saudi Arabia with the, uh, with the aim of kind of facilitating regional um, trade and um, transactions um, using the yuan. Um, the same thing could be said about Iran and India, Iran and uh, South Korea. And what is interesting and I wanted to highlight here is that um, uh, in, uh, in 2018, India was granted by the US a rare Iran sanctions waiver for projects related to Iranian concessions in its Chabahar port. Now, why this is important, because to me, what it, and that's how I'm going to connect this back to the protest, is that at the end of the day, and I'm uh, rephrasing, paraphrasing, and a beautiful article that I read in Boston Review uh, titled On Solidarity. So at the end of the day, the very forces that impose crippling sanctions may compete and make war with one another, but when it comes to maintaining the order of global capitalism or to their interests in the region, they actually collaborate and work together. And so I think in a world in flux, Iran's geopolitical assets also has, its, uh, has helped it endure its, um, um, in, endure the protests. The lack of success. Yes, thank you very much. Ali, do you want to add? Um, yes, but then I, I can connect it to what I was talking to about. To whatever you want. So <laughs> Arang mentioned that um, the opposition didn't offer a viable alternative. And we do see this in the patterns. So I mentioned the patterns of women like freedom and the 2019. It would be interesting also to look at the pattern of 2013 and 2017 uh, bo presidential election votes. So in those two elections, when we look at the correlation between these et ethnic groups and the votes, it's, there is a very uh, clear pattern. So ethnic min excluded ethnic minorities, Kurds, uh, Turks, Baluch, Turks to a degree, they voted for the reformist moderate back candidate Hassan Rouhani. Farce and the Farce speakers region voted for Raisi. This is a pattern that is not usually talked about, but when I looked at the data, I saw that areas with more Farsi speakers, they, there, there is a conservative vote. And then we, when we compare it with the, the protest patterns, so it's obvious the electoral turnout has gone down. So the coalition that Rouhani, I mean, I don't think he brought it together himself. They just, they were looking for reform. They thought he's off offering reform, so they voted for him. That coalition disintegrated and came out of the system. So the, the votes, it's competitive, but it's within the venues of the regime of the Islamic Republic. Uh, the conservatives decided that they don't want any serious rival. So the last presidential election, it was basically Raisi and no other serious challenger. So the result of this is that a lot of the voters didn't have any candidates, and they were already disappointed from the system. So they didn't vote. But this is an important point. Um, when a regime lose support, that support does not automatically go to the opposition. And we see that in the pattern of the uh, protest. So yes, the last time Arabs protested, they had voted for Rouhani. This time they didn't protest. Kurds protested and Baluch joined them, but we don't see the same from other ethnic groups. The demands that have been presented that is asking for the radical transformation of the regime requires a broad coalition. And we do see that ethnic patterns, they are very active and they are kind of predictive of the, the the scope of the protest. So the coalition that happened in this protest, uh, there was a scale shift that Baluch uh, cities joined, but we do, we do not see other ethnic groups joined like in their entirety. Of course, cities with other ethnic groups protested. There were protests in Arab cities, Turkish cities, in the north of Iran. But when we look at the data, we don't see a pattern that all the, for example, districts with those type of population 
protested. So in the elections, we do see this multi-ethnic protest. I also have data on Iran-Iraq war that I've been working on. Ir during 1980s, Iranian government, uh, they mobilized a lot of recruits, voluntary recruits, uh, along with uh, draftees. There also you see the multi-ethnic coalition that the regime, so these are the two major ways that I think the Iranian regime have been able to channel high level of mobilization that Orang mentioned from within. So 1980s war was important. After 1980s, these elections were important. There is no war, obviously, and the elections have become uh, meaningless. So the, the government has lost a lot of support, but that support has not, that lost support has not been articulated in a broad coalition. And what's been missing, I think, is that viable alternative, which has to be translated into organizing and coalition. So this, this actually connects to what I was thinking when Arang was, th uh, was talking about, which is just to take a step back for a second. I mean, the one way for me to understand what you're talking about is you're saying, you know, these, the, the, the satisfaction is not being translated into collective action, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So, so it's a lack of collectivity. And in some ways, what you were talking about, Arang, also has to do with that. And, but to me, then, one way, another way of thinking about this, and people had talked about it, is that it was already clear in the protest itself, in what people were asking for, that they were not asking for a collective change. That there was, when people would talk about Gen Zers, right, they were talking about, oh, this is different from previous protests because it's about the right of the body, and this goes back to um, the work that um, Nazanin has done, that it is in some ways an individual request, right? So in some ways, is it unfair of you guys to even ask of this movement to have led to a collective action and then say, therefore, it didn't, therefore, it was defeated? Is the fact that women are already walking down the streets without a hijab on and that there is now a hijab bill in parliament itself not a symbol that within its own parameters this move even within what you were talking about Ali this movement actually succeeded you know it was not defeated it would only be defeated if you think every protest has to lead to some kind of protect, uh, collective action and this is for all of you <laughs> uh, especially sure. the ones who am I are arguing with <laughs> um, I mean sure I mean I, I use the term, I was trying to be partly provo provocative, to call it defeated. I mean, I, when, uh, when that many Iranians for that many weeks went to the streets and called for the death of the dictator, the, the removal of the Islamic Republic, uh, burning of you know, key symbols of what the regime is about, I, I take that as that's the objective, right? Clearly, the opposition outside of uh, diaspora has that objective too. But let's just bracket them out. Um, but you know that that that's the goal. That's why I do like um, the difference between anti-regime protests and protests trying to get your pension back, trying to get uh, higher salaries, farmers trying to get access to water. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, all of those things that that happen almost on a daily basis and have for about 25 years. These, the, the tenor is different. So I, I would, I, you know, unfortunately, um, I, I and many of us don't get to go to Iran as much as we like, but from conversations and reading newspapers and blogs and, and, and so forth, my sense is that the people are def deflated. They're not happy with just being able to walk around the city without uh, their veil. They're, it, you know, they are. They note that. They see that as a success. They see that as a, a continual challenge um, to patriarchy. Whether that patriarchy is their brother, their father, or the, the supreme leader, they understand what they're doing politically. And I think many of them will continue, and they and, and they're going to pay a, a high price for it, and whether it's monetary or, unfortunately, um, with prison terms and so forth. Um, but that's not what the objective is, and to, to, to scale up, you, you, you need organization. But let me just end with by saying, I don't think Iranians are alone in this. I mean, for those of you in this room who follow news from many parts of the world, we, you know, we've, over the last, whatever, 10 years in the United States, we keep talking about a crisis of democracy and so forth. But I think it's time for us also to talk about a crisis of social, social movements or protests. Well, clearly, 
in whatever, social media and various things have allowed people to articulate grievances. And it blows up in, in spectacular fashion. And people can get out, people get large people, large numbers of people out in the street, whether it's in, in Europe or North Africa or South America. Um, and you can have surprising election outcomes like you had in Guatemala a, a few weeks ago. So yes, those things happen. But to sustain it, um, we, it there is a pattern that across the world that's been, it's very hard for these protest movements to, to sustain it and translate the protests into political projects, uh, political platforms, and political, and it doesn't have to be a party or anything, but, but actual political uh, projects, let's for the lack of a term. I, mean, I think this is a good, uh, Nazan, did you want to say something? No, I was going to actually transition to a question, because it's a, I think it's a perfect way to transition to a question um, for you about something you said last year, which is you kind of touched on it. But last year, there was a lot of talk about this was a feminist movement. So when you're talking, you're both talking about, we're, we're all talking about what were the demands, right, of, of the movement last year. Everybody in social media, in the newspaper, were like, oh, Iran is seeing its feminist movement. Feminist movement. You touched on this a little bit last year. And I was wondering, now that you've had a year to think about it, but also in the context of what you said about the hijab bill, do you hold that to be the case still? And what would be your response to what is being said about the whole question of scaling up and the lack thereof? Right, right. I will keep my comments about um, uh, the, the lack of a political project, maybe if um, for the end, because I think it's actually an important question to kind of talk about the, uh, whether or not this was a feminist movement or with, how do we kind of think about this. So if, if I may, I'll start with that and then uh, I'll get back to the other point. So um, I think in response to your question, I'd like to highlight that um, for many women, um, the individual women that you're talking about, in the liminal moment of the protest, Unveiling did serve as an instance that provided, provided them with the opportunity to think of themselves, their bodies, its potential and capabilities differently. Um, however, the fact that the hijab was at the center of the protest, in my opinion, does not make the protest necessarily feminist. In the protest, the hijab became a powerful political signifier, a vehicle for the expression of frustration, which Ali kind of laid out, um, so diverse kinds of frustrations with di uh, di di uh, different forms of social injustices um, that were not necessarily related to the right of women over their bodies, their bodily autonomy. Um, it is in this context that protesters, male protesters in particular, welcomed, rallied around, and promoted the figure of the unveiled woman as a revolutionary figure. Um, however, as I also indicated last year, many of the men in the protest rationalized their presence um, um, using the patriarchal idiom of uh, we are here to protect our nomus, our women. Um, so um, this dynamic of protection points to a struggle between institutional patriarchy as embodied by the state and then the interpersonal everyday patriarchy as kind of acted out by um, male protesters. What's interesting is that in some of the conversations and um, interviews that I had with some, the, uh, some of the protesters, uh, some of them expressed anxiety about the potential of women breaching um, certain red lines, of women desiring to remove more than their headscarf, um, ex uh, experiencing these dynamics as empowering and exciting, but at the same time as worrying and emasculating moments. So the euphoria of seeing um, you know, the outpouring of people in the streets with political passion, um, I think should not uh, deflect from us seeing um, and registering and reflecting on these comments and, uh, and moments. Having said that, the protests have had implications that we can call feminist. Uh, the women that protested have been, as Arang already also highlighted, protagonists in revolutions inside their own homes. Um, and back out in the streets, although the majority of people arrested and executed were men, the centrality of female icons and their diverse positioning as women in the society has challenged dominant scripts in, which, um, uh, in ways that could have feminist implications. So when I'm talking about fem uh, female icons, I'm talking about Mahsa Jina Amini, 22-year-old single Kurdish woman. The other icons are the imprisoned journalists, 
The other icons are um, Bahare Hedayat and Nargis Muhammadis, whose letters have actually, from prison, have created waves. And then we have Gohare Ishqi, a 77-year-old mother um, uh, who was kind of pulled onto the political stage in 2014 when his son, a blogger, was, uh, died or was killed in, in, in prison. Um, so the power of these female icons, particularly their long-term implications on what the place of woman should be, um, I think should not be, um, should not be overlooked. Um, do I have time or shall I stop? It's, we're gonna, we, I'm gonna we'll come, give you time back. for uh, concluding remarks. <laughs> um, maybe we, should, we could move into that because I'm pretty sure everybody has. I asked everyone to prepare some concluding remarks and I asked them to do it with an eye towards the future. It also means that during Q&A, I'll ask you my foreign policy question. <laughs> so you're not without that. But I was just wondering, I'm gonna change the order and say in the context of everything we've said, um, why don't we start with you, Arang? Okay. Um, Do you wanna make some concluding remarks? Um, yeah, I just, uh, I just be brief, but uh, maybe I'll, um, I mean, uh, maybe I, I've sounded very pessimistic uh, overall, but I guess my concluding remarks, though, uh, I hope after a year of uh, witnessing what Iranians have been struggling with um, on the streets, in the prisons, in the, in the households, and I can't underline that enough for all of you, is that there are, there, from everything that I can hear, from family members I talk to, the friends I talk to, um, the, the struggles are really inside the home, in, in the neighborhood, right? You know, uh, neighbor, neighbor. preventing neighbors from um, mocking women and so forth. So they, they, these are really everyday, so when people talk about everyday struggles, you really get a sense of that this past year. Um, what, I wanna, what, I point, what I wanna point to is yes, we need to be, if you will, pessimist. What you got from me earlier was pessimism, or uh, the pessimism of the, what Gramsci used to call the pessimism of the intellect, right? Uh, realism, understanding that there are huge uh, obstacles, realizing that just because people have grievances, that doesn't mean that that will translate into social change and political power, right? Yes, many, many Iranians have grievances. Many, many Iranians do not like the Islamic Republic, but that doesn't, we can't just wishfully think that that's going to translate some, into some mathematical formula into revolution. Um, so we need to have that, if you will, pessimism of, of, of the intellect um, and think about these issues re realistically, understand the, 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 the Islamic Republic as, a, as, as I've, elsewhere I've written as, as an impro improvisational state. It's uh, what's striking to me in these 40 years that the Islamic Republic is very comfortable actually sh shifting and, 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 and changing and uh, accommodating the con to the context. So that, that's the challenge, and that's why we should be p uh, pessimistic. But I think at the same time, we have to be optimistic. Um, and by that, I mean, I mean, the only way, I mean, in a sense, these, the, these young people, these young women, men and women in Iran of this past year have taught me that you can only take to the street, you can only engage in, in politics if you, if you have some hope, right? And that's what I mean by optimism, that we have to actually hold on to that optimism that despite all of those challenges, there are, we can come up with new ways, new ways of being, new, new relationships, no, new coalitions hopefully are, are quite important. Um, and, and partly because it's clear that the Islamic Republic is scared, right? They wouldn't be doing all of these arrests. They wouldn't be coming up with these crazy laws and bills and so forth if they weren't fearful. They wouldn't be arresting the parents of these kids who have been killed, right? They're, they're scared of widow, um, widows and, 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 and parents who've lost family members. So we have to be hopeful that the, the, the political imagination and hope will generate new opportunities. And, and the Islamic Republic always is never has had full control. There will be future opportunities uh, that, uh, that could be seized in ways that we cannot predict. Uh, let me under, uh, underline that. Ali. Okay, I make three points. So just going back to the data, uh, I said so. I, one point was the trigger has shaped the geography of protest. I suspect this is the feature of failed protests. It, this also shows the weakness, organizational weakness. 
let me make a comparison with the Tunisian Revolution. So Muhammad, we all know the story, Muhammad Bouazizi, he died, he was poor, the protests spread first in the districts next to his district. There's a very great article that was published recently by my friend Christopher Berry. It shows that in the first stages of protests, lower, uh, less developed districts had higher rates of protest. Mm -hmm. But then a scale shifts happen. And for the later stages of pro revolution, that is not a predictor. So for the expansion to happen, the trigger should not predict everything toward the end of the episode. So I, can, I imagine in a hypothetical world, an episode that led to some sort of radical transformation, the trigger would shape the geography of the protest until certain points, and then we would see new dynamics to emerge. Um, second thing which is related to this, I think there was a type of mentality uh, when the protests were happening that this is, it's over, like next week or two weeks, or <laughs> people were di discuss, debating how, how Hashtag long. Hashtag in our revolution. Yeah, it's, it's over, and they were already saying, okay, who should be included in the day after or not? I think a lot of people are realizing this type of like short-term thinking that just come out tomorrow, it's, that the regime is gonna just drop like an apple from a tree. This is not very realistic. It looks like to me that whatever is happening is going to be step by step. Uh, each of these episodes has certain precautions but for the regime, for the opposition, and for the next episode. And one last thing I think which goes parallel with organizational weakness and is related to that is the importance and power of social media. So a lot of the messaging that the opposition and diaspora was doing was performative. People were trying to say the right thing for social media to get more likes. So there was at some point competition about who can say the worst curse about Islamic Republic, who can say Islamic Republic is the most terrible, most dirty, nasty, and it is all of those things. And we watch all of those videos that become very angry and very upset. But what gets most likes on social media does not certainly bring together a coalition and uh, de de design a, or craft a strategy for, to expand the movement to have that scale shift. Actually, um, I, I just want to take off from where um, you left off, and it's, it's sad if I'm the last uh, comment, uh, person commenting here because it's going to be a very pessimistic what I'm going to say. Don't worry. As um, some people in the audience know, I always get the last word, so don't worry about oh, Very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wanted to highlight one thing, just going back to the question about feminism. Um, I wanted to highlight dif uh, dif um, offer a distinction between two notions, women in movements and feminist movements. I think in order for a movement to be called a feminist movement, there has to be um, you know, a commitment to the pursuit of gender justice and social political transformation and not merely change of a political regime. So that kind of like for a movement to be called a feminist movement, there needs to be um, a, a feminist future, feminist alternatives, a viable political project. Um, and I think my colleagues here have argued um, that that was, that's what was missing, lacking. So going back, because you said, is it fair even to talk about the protests? I want to say it's not about fairness, but it also pushes us to think about the context. So where can this vision or this political project actually develop in? We need civil society for that, uh, which can sustain the public sphere in which these kinds of uh, discussions or coalitions could be, uh, could be uh, made. Now, looking at the past, for decades, but especially the past decade, what we see is that civil society has been um, eroded. Um, we have, what we see is intensified secura securitization and surveillance has rendered civic engagement a perilous activity. Actually, just this past week or a few weeks ago, a few days ago, there was a text message SMS sent to all telephone subscribers, uh, warning them about attending anticipated workshops on women's rights. And they said these workshops are designed as part of the enemy's soft uh, war. Um, so the activities, at least the state is giving the impression that everything is being monitored. The second thing is the discouragement um, of the formation of new organizations, but also the active tackle, uh, tracking and shutting down of NGOs and networks whose base is expanding. 
A good example is Imam Ali Foundation uh, Society, which was dissolved in 2021. Um, it was for poverty alleviation, and it had just become a very popular NGO. The third one, which I think one of the distinguished speakers here mentioned, is the parallel cre creation of an alternative civil society, or I'd like to call it uncivil civil society. And uh, going back to Gramsci, I want to use a pun here. So I call it that the stage is engaged in some sort of war of positioning. Um, meaning it positions loyal supporters in key roles to be mobilized in critical moments such as during last year's protests. What does this help the state to do? The, these help ensure, just as they did last year, some degree of business as usual. So when the students in Sharif University and elsewhere announce that they're going on strikes or they're, going not, they're boycotting classes, let's not forget that according to official statistics, 35,000 of the university professors are members of the Basij uh, centers. So a lot of these professors actually, and uh, Nagme mentioned that a lot of professors in recent uh, months have also been sacked. In their place, they're recruiting loyal professors. So these professors actually keep their classes going. We also have um, uh, loyal supporters of the regime among the students, including Basiji students. These students also refuse to boycott classes. And if the class has a professor and enough students to kind of maintain the business of normal, uh, uh, the business as normal um, uh, image. As normal. Uh, business as normal image, yes. Another thing is that in the past decade, there have been many community centers opened up in the neighbor neighborhood. In my book, I call this the municip municipalization of the state. So they have opened up all these community centers in different neighborhoods. And just this past few weeks, uh, uh, the mayor of Tehran announced I don't know if it was the past few weeks, but months, don't quote me. Anyway, in the recent year, in, 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 this, in, in, this, in, in this year, that uh, they're going to um, allow um, Basij and Sepo to use these community centers as their branches and offer kind of services to the neighborhoods. So basically, they're colonizing the very spaces that these, uh, the municipality had provided for people before. So in this desertified civil landscape, the protests and their fate made clear that we need to go, and this is my final remarks just to be uh, optimistic, made clear that we need to go beyond indignation because I don't think just expressing frustration and indignation will topple any regime. We need to kind of articulate these or transmute them to, into a political project. And we need to go beyond this to develop a, a politics inspired by creativity, imagination, and vision. And the good thing is that the Iranian protesters have shown that they do not lack any of these. So remain hopeful. Thank you so much. Um, this is a perfect uh, way of transitioning to questions from the audience. There is a microphone there I can see. And yeah, feel free to ask your question. Yeah, Mona. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to be? I can ask a question, then you can be the second one. <laughs> Supposed to, you have to use the microphone because it's being um, live streamed. regime as a very strong regime 
and we are looking at society, generations of society, and because this society and the youth that you are mentioning have been trained, going to universities, eating and living in the everyday life under that regime, but they still find themselves in the streets and they were able to mobilize. So I'm curious where are the source of this mobilization is coming from? Because when you compare Iranian youth with the neighborhood countries of the youth, which are also under authoritarian, kind of authoritarian regimes, but we don't find a similar spirit that move the youth to the streets. So I, I, I want to focus still on Iran, so I'm not going to bring yeah. other countries, but you know which other countries. So I want us to talk about <laughs> more about the source of this protest spirit and social movement and the source of this mobilization in Iran that created this tradition of resilience in the protest movement. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just add, because I had one of the questions I had was connected to what you said, which is going back to the Arab Spring part of Mona's question, you know, we start, you started, well, maybe 2013, maybe 2014, but 2017 and then 2019. But 20, 2009 is kind of left out of the story. So going, it, it, so is it because of 2011, is it the Arab Spring that's triggering this, these series of protests that you're seeing? So if, just start with Ali and then we can, whoever wants to answer. Yeah. I even go back, I go to the Constitutional Revolution. <laughs> <laughs> So since then, even before then, the tobacco movement, we see high levels of mobilization happening in Iranian society. I mean, Iran, uh, Arang mentioned Iran has been contentious for the last two decades, I would say, for longer than the last century. And there has been periods of quiescence. So at, at times, uh, repression has brought down the protest, or the political regime had, has been able to conduct it within the internal channels of the regime, which would be elections. We had elections before the revolution. Sometimes they were competitive, people participated. Then we had the war. We also have top-down mobilization that the Islamic Republic has a pioneer of just bringing their supporters to the streets. So you all watched footage from uh, Hassan Soleimani's funeral. That was their event with the largest turnout. but. Those type of things happen every week in Iraq, it, at a smaller scales throughout the country. Um, so the regime does that, but the, the society basically wants to participate in shaping their own destiny. And th this is because I think repression is not going to stop it. Because I, I look at this last century, one year, ten, eight years, 10 years, then it erupts. So it, it's like this, there is energy in there. This energy has to go. Uh, somewhere. So the sources are the country has been developing, uh, people have been educated, and now there is a lot of access to what happens in the in the world. But this is also the case in the constitutional revolution. Iranians just took a lot of inspiration about what happens in the rest of the world. We talked about the Gen Z. The Gen Z is very progressive in all of the countries, including in Iran, because they read the most recent thing, the norms about like gender and how to be woke and like things like that. So they take inspiration, and there is also this whole century of contention. So they also take inspiration from what has happened uh, before the previous generations. They might be critical of they didn't do it the right way. We are going to do it the right way, but they still ma do make a reference to the uh, that they tried, but they failed. Now we are going to change it. So there are, these are a few, I think, sources of, I think, mobilization and inspiration. As an historian, I actually have a problem with the fact that you take okay. the history back so far. <laughs> <laughs> but we have time later for that. Another thing, do you want to I don't have much <clears throat> to add to what Ali um, just said, but I wanted to highlight, maybe actually just emphasize or highlight three of the points that Ali already said. One is um, that uh, um, uh, actually, up until a few years ago, Iran was probably one of the youngest countries in the world, so um, um, uh, with uh, the majority of its population below the age of 35. That is changing, and that's going to be a problem in the future, but we need to take that into account, that we are talking about a very young kind of population. 
And the, uh, the other thing is that this young population, we can call it unintended consequences of other states' policies, but this young population is very educated. Um, the universities have actually been, so as part of the populist aspect of the revolution and the state, you know, there were universities in every corner, in every, uh, in every kind of uh, village that I visited, there was a university. And so university students eventually also gained kind of social and political capital in these kind of um, uh, villages. So um, I think Charles Kurzman, a decade ago went to Iran and then, or maybe even longer, and wrote that there is a feminist generation kind of growing uh, up in Iran. Another reason that we see the growth of this generation is also that we, especially among the opposition, there is this idea that, you know, let us be the voice of Iranian people or make their voice be heard by others as if Iran is isolated from the rest of the world. It's not, I mean, global forces these days, North Korea aside, do not allow actually the, the uh, total isolation of a population. Um, there's high internet usage. Actually, Iranian IT is very good there. They immediately, the state bans uh, channels. They come up with proxies, VPNs. So this connectivity to the world, I think, is what Ali also mentioned, that uh, makes them kind of, there. there's this exposure to all sorts of discourses that are going on, not only to the global north, but also regional and uh, regional discourses as, um, as well. I'm going to stop there. Uh, very briefly, I uh, just. Two, two things, I mean, I agree with a lot of the things that have been said, but uh, one, a year after the original panel, one of the things I, I, I kicked myself for not thinking about more is that we, we COVID yeah. is significant. And it was extremely significant in, in Iran um, because Iran was hit very hard, as you, as you probably all know. Um, and then the sanctions. We, I know I, I'm probably going to get lambasted for mentioning sanctions, but sanctions matter. Uh, but they matter for, 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 they don't matter for all of society in the same way. All the women this, in this room know what COVID did to women and women's employment. Yeah. Women, I mean, so for me, COVID and sanctions deeply impacted Iranian women, right? There's some research coming out showing this. Uh, Zeb Kalb, to give him a shout out, has been sh is, is looking into this. Uh, Iranian women disproportionately work in the state sector, uh, which has, has been slashed because of uh, a budget crisis, bu budget cutbacks, and so forth, and in agricultural work, um, which was also shut. So, I, I think one, when we think about the context for these protests, I think we cannot ignore COVID uh, and ten years of brutal sanctions that have been hurting many Iranians, but I think women um, have, uh, young women, um, have been particularly uh, negatively hurt. And they've been forced back in the home where they've had to confront patriarchy and inequality on an everyday basis. Uh, taking care of small kids while working, double shift, the stories that you guys all probably know, right? Uh, what happened to American women in, 20, uh, in 2020? So that's one thing. The second thing I'll just say is, I mean, the, what's different about Iran than many of its neighboring countries is that it had a revolution in 1979. And there is a whole set of expectations that people have. And, and it's a regime that actually, I went to Tunisia about 15 years ago on an election day. You, you wouldn't even know there was an election. The Islamic Republic, there's something interesting. Islamic Republic can't have an election turnout of 10%. Right? And it can't cook it to make it 90%. Right? The Islamic Republic wants people to come out and it has to have some sort of, gen because it's a revolutionary system, so it has a certain set of obligations that, that uh, you know, there is something to political cultures, but it's a political culture that's shared both by the, the establishment or the, or the state as well as society. So I think that that, that kind of a moral economy um, perspective is also a useful lens to understand what makes Iranians more contentious. I, w I won't go all the way back to the constitutional revolution, but in these last 40 years, um, that, that, that it's, it's a, it, it matters that it was a revolution, not a military coup or a foreign intervention. Uh, and I would add the war. I, I think we keep yeah, dropping the yeah, war yeah. off, and I think you mentioned it in your research, is that when you have a whole generation involved in the bloodiest yeah. you know, conventional war of the 20th century, eight years, I mean, we're not talking about 
world wars, that creates an expectation of what society, a state owes you for you or your family having gone and done that. And I think that creates contentious politics within it. Hi, Hi. So I wanted to ask you a question about uh, mobil social mobilization and elite factionalization. So those of us who study regime change know social mobilization alone is not going to bring down a regime. There has to be some kind of alliance with different elites in, the, in, in power. And I'm just wondering, I have not followed the case of Iran that carefully. How, has, how have elites responded to this? Has there been a united front, or do you see different institutions, the judiciary, or the educational elite, or the, even the military as opposed to the uh, Revolutionary Guard? Do we see any difference among the elites taking sides on this issue? Do we see the possibility of creating a fissure that could be exploited when Khamenei dies? Whoever wants expertise. Well, uh, publicly what happened during this last episode, there was no clear cracks within the elite. Why? I think because most of the elites that would have disagreed had already been purged. And that was an important context. And that's why we see places with lower turnout had higher protest rate because the, the competition is related to the lower electoral turnout, which is related to uh, protest participation. Um, there are a lot of, diff I mean, there is still factionalism within the Islamic Republic, but this factionalism has changed from the factionalism that we have seen before. I think one major change that has happened is that when you look at 1980s or 1990s, there were clear ideological and policy differences between factions. There is much less of that, and I would say there is a higher competition over spoils, and there's is also uh, the level of corruption has really increased in the Islamic Republic. Um, so that's one, some people say we are, it, current situation is close to 1980s. I would say that's the big difference is that the, the, the corruption was lower and the perceptions of cor corruption also were not uh, like we have seen. I personally don't, I mean there could be, Crack, uh, cracks could happen. So some, there were some uh, uh, tapes that were leaked about conversations uh, that uh, conversations between the commanders of revolutionary guards. And what we saw that there were cracks between the middle rank commanders and the top commanders. At the top level, there was no cracks, but some of the middle rank commanders were saying that we cannot answer to our troops, like they they're not convinced that. Um, so they man this. The leaks came later. It was not during the protest. So I think during the protest they managed to keep it covered, and it stayed within the middle and lower rank. Next time, I don't know what is going to happen. It depends on a lot of factors. So it doesn't mean there is no cracks within the regime, but at least at the top it's been unified because of the purges they have done over the last few. Do either of you want to also pick up on the last part of Eva's question about the implications of it for succession or for change? I, I don't want to respond to that, but I actually wanted to highlight Arang's first book, um, The State and the Bazaar. I'm sorry, I know we're not supposed to mention that, but because when you talk about the elites, I think we need to think about institutions or spaces where these elites could be produced, right? Aside from, oh, you're here. Aside from the state and um, um, the sepah that Ali mentioned, you have universities. We already talked about ha what's happening in that space. There was the bazaar that Arang wrote about, and maybe you want to elaborate on that. The bazaaris were actually actively political before the revolution, contributed to the revolution, and then the bazaar was, am I uh, presenting your book very well? <laughs> Co-opted and sort of depoliticized. I think, um, again, this is not my expertise, but my understanding and reading of following the um, transformations in the past 40 years, the same has happened with the clerical establishment, with the clergy. Um, the clergy actually, both before the revolution, but af also after the revolution, was, was an institution that was producing a lot of kind of dissident and op op oppositional voices. But all of those voices were eventually also kind of purged. 
And so now, um, yes, we see a lot of money being channeled through to the seminaries and all of that, but it has created also a division among the clergy. So it's like those who are closer to the government. So it's the proximity to the, uh, the um, centers of power that makes them um, stay in power, basically. So I think it has been also this active depolitization politicization of institutions that could have potentially produced um, the elites that could then come up with alliances. Um, all right. but, sorry, but historically, the clerical body has not, the majority has not been in opposition to the state. Right. Even up to 79, the radical cler clerics were the minority. So in some ways, I think it's actually similar in that you have just the majority of the clerical body supporting state policies. Um, maybe it's less than it was, but you need a spark maybe. But I, I agree with what you're saying, but I do think actually you made me think that there's a lot more continuity in terms of where the clerical body is in terms of an opposition to state policies. No, just to, 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 to um, uh, Professor Bellin's uh, question, I think, I mean, a lot, a lot of people were looking for that in September, October, November, because, um, you know, maybe wishfully thinking, oh, maybe the... The, the Revolutionary Guard Corps were split from the Spirit Supreme Leader and align, aligned themselves with the people like in, in Egyptian type scenario and so forth. But the it's a testament that, to the regime going back, I mean, that, that they were able to maintain a high degree of cohesion, uh, whatever you want to call it, solidarity, to stay on the same page. Well, even though there was clearly tensions amongst them, but they were maintain that. So it's a, I think it is a legitimate puzzle to think through how that, what, what are the factors that prevents uh, elite fra uh, factionalism not, not leading to um, uh, you know, actual rupture, not leading to a kind of a pacted transition. In, in the late 1990s and 2000s, the reformist era, that's what was kind of emerging that in a sense got, uh, got sidelined. And here I'll go back to Nazanin's point. I think the international context here does, ma does matter. The Iranian elite, are un they do share one thing, and that is that we have, we have, we're confronted by enemies who want to destroy us. Um, and they're not completely delusional in that, right? Um, and so the fact that the, the, uh, Iran is kind of an international pariah and the, all of these elites are in that same boat in that sense probably drives them closer together and prevents or limits the chance of some sort of um, like kind of 1980s Latin American pacted transition kind of model. Inside that, what you're asking me is get inside uh, the, the minds of politicians. I mean, what I would say about the, the regional context in the past year, and it, kind of echoing what was already said, is, is you know, while many people were wishfully thinking that this is the end of the regime, what is striking is that the Chinese, the Emiratis, the Saudis, they all bet on the Islamic Republic, right? There was agreements that were signed when China brokered that agreement between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Clearly, relations between the UAE and Iran improved. I mean, it, it's clear that m in many capitals around the world, uh, not the US and not in Western Europe, people saw what was happening in Iran and they basically bet on the Islamic Republic uh, surviving. The Biden administration didn't know what to do, and I think clearly they were amongst them, they were divided, and they actually thought, yes, maybe this is the end of this. Countries, uh, improved relations with Israel. 
Yeah, no, it's going to be, uh, it's going to create lots of uh, strange bedfellows, right? Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> I, th I mean, and that, yeah, that's, that's not, that's maybe not a necessarily a bad thing. I mean, these are the countries in the region. Uh, yeah. Thank you for being so patient. Of course. Uh, this was briefly mentioned, but I wondered if you guys could elaborate. Uh, just like in the Arab Spring, in which people utilized Twitter and Facebook to mobilize and spread awareness and solidarity to those protests, we've seen the internet and social media being utilized and implemented in mobilizing and spreading solidarity regarding the 2022 revolutions in Iran. But I guess my question is, has social media and the internet at large actually helped the Iranian people gain more rights, or does it simply create this false perception of mass change? in which we engage in posts and videos that sort of outrage us while there's little change on the actual government and policy levels. Like, does social media actually help create change through protests, or does it simply create a conception of revolution and international unity while actually pacifying the need for real change? <laughs> and you have one minute to answer that question. <laughs> I really don't have a, I have not thought. Of I'll give a short answer, both. Um, that's always the easiest answer, but, but I, I'm not saying this to, to not respond to your question. I actually think internet did provide both a space where a lot of mobilization could happen, a lot of news could actually be shared among people, um, a lot of what's happening, I mean, that's Ali's source of uh, research now, is, uh, because a lot of the videos that Ali has access to were actually uh, went viral on internet. So in that sense, yes, but it did also create these kind of bubbles where people thought it's the next day, this is it, it's done. Um, what I wanted to highlight about um, uh, social media, but also satellite channels and all that, which is probably worth mentioning, is that what we, see, we keep hearing is this distinction between those of us who are here versus, versus, versus those who are there inside Iran. And I think actually a lot of this this distinction was blurred in the sense that I was talking to um, people in Iran and they were telling me, yes, this happened, they, they killed, there was like grenade, there, this happened. And I said, uh, and then at some point during the conversation, they would say, didn't you watch it on, the, on, on TV? And what TV? These are the same satellite channels that people were watching. So I thought initially that I was getting authentic, you know, first-hand impressions about what's going on in Iran. It was already mediated through that. So I think we should also look at both internet, Twitter, and all of these things, but also the other kind of these channels as places where um, a lot of our understanding about the uprisings, revolutions, and things are mediated through these spaces. Thank you. Can I just, I just want to add one thing because it's such an important um, discussion that we've all been had, having. I think in 2009 in Iran during the Green Movement, everybody talked about Twitter, Twitter, Twitter. But the difference between that and this moment, and in 2009 there was also independent reporting on the ground. Um, and there isn't now. And so it's, I think the whole question of social media that we all ask can't happen in a vacuum in which we don't talk about just run-of-the-mill normal journalism. So that answer is going to change. And I'll just give you an example. We all thought everything was hot, 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 and you were there. We, had, we were on a group with, on Zoom with a bunch of people who were also in Iran, and everybody who was outside of Iran was like, you know, remember what I'm talking about? It's like, <coughs> what's going on? Like, what, in your neighborhood, tell us what's going on. And he was like, um, just went outside for, just bought some cigarettes, and... Uh, Things seem fine, I don't know. And he was just genuinely surprised, but I think that's because what you said, that's the flip side of that, right? That, that it, it also just, we don't know what's going on. We just see images of what somebody thinks we should see is going on. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna say that uh, Ahmad Kasravi, about 100 years ago, he predicted that uh, mullahs will take over someday, uh, and it's happening and he predicted that things are gonna get really, really messy. This is 100 years ago. Today we're seeing it right now. Uh, just a couple of things I wanna mention. September 15 is the anniversary of Masa Amini Jina, uh, which is expected to have large protests all over the world. There are about eight million Iranians outside of Iran, and they're gonna be in, in the major cities, even Boston. Um, just this past uh, September 12th, which is a couple of days ago, the Congress, U.S. Congress, passed the Mahsa Act. I was wondering, questioning your panel, 
what ramification is this going to have in the future, near and in the future, and what we can do to help this movement of women movement in Iran. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have, we're at time, so if you want to just give quick comments and then we can wrap up or a response about what we can do and what the ramifications are. I think main thing we can do is to be able to cooperate with each other, be organized, uh, be able to agree about how to disagree. If, if we can organize a democratic way of life among the diaspora that we haven't been able to, <laughs> then, then we can hope that this also happens in Europe. Any other thoughts? Thank you so much. Um, I just want to say, as people were talking, I was thinking about, because I do get the last word, Nazani. Um, <laughs> I was thinking that when the Iranian Revolution happened, the Middle East Report, Amerip project, had this thing where Fred Halliday, who was a very important person, put out a piece, a scholar, put out a piece, Iran one year after the revolution. And then it was Iran two years after the revolution. <laughs> then it was, and then at some point it jumped. It was like three and four, and then it was 10. Um, and I so hope that the Crown Center is now going to do next year, bring you all here and do <laughs> Iran two years after the movement. As long as you bring the same panelists. Sure. We're going to bring the same panelists. It's, been all, it's always a pleasure and it's always a privilege to be in conversation with you. Thank you and thank you all. Um, and see you next year.